welcome to this month's Stone Shout of the Telly, Change the Message on it, with me, your host, Rebecca Ritson. Our special topic this month is the economy, and we're very lucky to have with us Stuart Simpson, who writes widely in the economy and works in the city. So, Stuart, if you'd like to kick us off, please. If the credit crunch has shown us anything, it's shown us the dire consequences of what can happen when the economy just becomes a technical, managerial uh, discussion. To summarise, I think there's three stories that people are telling at the moment. One is the story of the reckless bankers that have destroyed Western economies. The other one is the idea that there's an imbalance in how the global economy operates. And America and the West have been relying on wealth generated elsewhere in the global economy. And then there's a final story about how this relates to the decline of manufacturing within uh, the UK particularly. They appear to be very technical explanations of what's taking place, but there's real political consequences to how we understand these things. Well, there's so much to talk about from that, from those points. I just wanted to start with your final point about manufacturing in the world economy, because Britain, well, obviously, we're now very low on it, or we have a very a manufacturing level that's far behind everyone else. Do you think that we can catch up with the world and gain a level of manufacturing that can sustain us? Or should we carry on relying on a financial system that is evidently flawed or that has had problems and that's now damaged? There certainly has been a relative decline in UK manufacturing. The UK is still a huge manufacturing economy and it's the seventh largest exporter in the world of manufactured goods. One of the things which has happened um, over the past 20 years or so is that there's been a real shift which is accelerating of certain types of manufacturing towards the developing world. This is something that we should be able to see as good for everybody because it means that countries like China, um, whose average income in China has been going at 10% for the past uh, 10 20, 30 years, which is a huge benefit to people in that part of the world. Everybody can produce more and be better off without um, damaging the rest of the world. The financial services sector was the most dynamic part of the UK economy, supported by the UK government for the past 20 or 30 years. But now the situation is nobody knows what's going to happen in the near future. And there's these decisions that have been taken about the future of a very important part of the UK economy, which are happening without any real public discussion about what's taking place there. So decisions which are going to affect our lives for the next generation are just happening behind closed doors. It's essentially the government that is deciding how to rule this, how to rule this crisis, even though it's at the end of the day, the British public and the world public, other Western societies that are going to be the, the debtors who are going to pull out the, the money. In terms of the public, I think that's part of a more general problem of people's disinterest in the financial system. They've seen it as a kind of um, something that goes on over their heads, something that's boring, something they're not interested in. You know, it, when there's a war, you see protest marches if people aren't interested. Well, if people are so bothered about the takeover of Lloyd's and, and Royal Bank of Scotland, why were there no protest marches? Why are we not seeing any groups, you know, doing anything about it? I think there is a big part of the blame for these things happening to, to lay at the door of the public for being so disinterested in these issues. Surely the, the government's reaction and the way of dealing with the crisis, um, I mean, we, we live in a democracy where we elect our government and so they, it's their responsibility we haven't elected it. the Prime Minister, though. Democracy does also require um, a bit of leadership and conviction on the part of the government so that you know, the public can engage with what they're discussing. Whereas at the moment, it seems to want to pretend that what's actually happening isn't happening. So on the one hand, it wants to say that the state will bail out these banks. It will stand behind RBS and Lloyds, putting extra billions of pounds. And on the other hand, it's saying that, well, actually, these institutions should still remain private. So you see a real sense of cowardice on the part of the political leaderships. Instead of saying, we need to have it one way or the other, you know, is, is the state supporting this sector? You know, if it is, then the government should take control of it. If the government then says that, then that poses real questions about how it should be managed. And then it became, became a real political discussion. How do you um, respond to a government policy which is focusless? You know, how do you have an engagement with uh, you know, democratic discussion about something which doesn't have any focus to begin with? I think there's also a couple of relationships that are um, missed out in sort of public discussion and in the media, and that's um, to do with the Bank of England and the FSA. There's, there's been a bit of, about the FSA recently, but 
Um, I mean, the government's relationship with the Bank of England, that's changed quite a lot, hasn't it? The thing that uh, Gordon Brown likes to celebrate as his greatest achievement was when Labour came to power, one of the first acts was to make the Bank of England independent of political discussion. And actually, it had the consequence of saying that there's certain decisions about the economy which shouldn't be discussed publicly because the public can't be trusted with um, a discussion about how the Bank of England um, operates. If the public's involved, then it become populist, was the idea. So something should be it should be removed from public discussion and ergo the management of the economy would be more stable if put into the hands of experts. I think that's really problematic development and has led to the situation where people are quite confused about their relationship to economic decisions. I think on the, the FSA and regulation more generally, this is one of the things again that um, London was often counterposed to New York in London has a light touch regulation, the city is just more, much more dynamic. New York, on the other hand, you know, everyone's suing each other uh, at the drop of the hat in America is a much more dangerous place to operate in that sense, much more constricted, whereas London was celebrated as you know, being more dynamic. But I think there's a clear sense now that that can't continue the way the city is operated. But the political leadership who was celebrating that um, only a few years ago They've not come back and said, well, maybe that was a mistake. You know, maybe we made a mistake here. Instead, they've said, Fred Goodwin, he's the problem. You know, he made bad decisions. Whereas only a few years ago, they were celebrating people like Sir Fred, Fred Goodwin. So then do we think that the government are scapegoating a little bit? Definitely. I, I think they have been. These same people that are being blamed now were praised upon and they looked upon, oh my gosh, they're doing so well and stuff. And But now they're completely being switched on. They're like the people to target for all the issues that are happening now. And I think another important issue is the fact that for so long there was no intervention. Like, why was that? Now we're being hit with this situation and it seems that there's been no intervention beforehand with, you know, the fact that we've been able to take out loans for this amount. And obviously, bank-wise, they've encouraged us to take out that amount of money and it seems that now we're being hit with it and we're meant to be supported or had this high being supporting us. And where was that? We've got to deal with having less money in our economy and having to somehow settle and deal with having less money to buy things with. And, you know, we're not a third world country, so why should we have to deal with that situation ourselves? It seems like we're dealing with it ourselves, you know. I'm not sure the public are to blame at all, actually. Mm. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they're, they're not, to, to some extent, I, I'd agree with you, they're not at all. Um, and the fact that, you raised a really good point um, um, before, with regards to um, the, like, us as people having more interest in the financial situation, but... With no focus and direction, with the people above us, how are we meant to have interest in it? It's like people like Obama, he's come in now, and there seems to be a bigger drive in what's going on in financial situations over in the US. If we had someone like that, you know, that would engage us more, and where we're more involved in what's happening, I think we would generally have a bigger interest in the financial situation. No, but, but I mean, is that actually true? I, I just think Obama's been decisive, mm. and that's true, and that feeds back on what you're saying. You know, I think in terms of the whole debate over this government dithering in between having one foot in each way, I think the fact that there's been a change of regime in the US and that Obama has come in and put this massive, you know, bailout on the table, it, it looks more decisive, which which prevents this kind of panic, which, it, to, be, to be honest, it sounds like you've kind of got. It sounded like you were torn between, you know, we're lumbered in this situation, we're stuck, you know, why isn't someone helping us? And, you know, but we are a bit to blame. There's, it just, it just seems exactly like the confusion Stuart was pointing out. But, I mean, if it is seen that Obama is being a lot more decisive, we need to know exactly what he's doing. And I mean, I don't exactly know what this, what effect this bailout is going to have on the US or the global economy. Obviously, there's a difference between immediate responses, which, especially when they're as large as what's going on in the United States, um, can appear very dynamic in a way. You know, the American government is raising massive amounts of debt and spending a lot of money. But what's the long-term view? There's a response, a crisis management response, that is much more forceful in the United States, ameliorating the worst effects of what's going on in the States. You know, spend more now, you know, stop uh, jobs being lost immediately. But then what do we think about a more a long-term strategy? You know, the role of manufacturing in the economy. It's not clear to me from the masses that is out there how how serious this is as it compares with, I mean, recessions are frequent and they're, some people say that, you know, they come in cycles. It's not billed as being a depression, but if it's going to be, you know, for a while people thought that it might be. But I would just like to know, you know, from your point of view, the gravity of this, because personally it's sort of 
becoming oversaturation of you know the discussions that we're having and and I would just like to know if we're going to make a long-term strategy how serious is this right now I think on the idea of um, recessions coming cycles is uh, one of the worst I ideas that come from economic thought in the 20th century the old business cycle recessions have reasons and those reasons need to be understood in terms of how bad things are then obviously um, what took place in America in the 1930s is a very different world America was a lot poorer then than it is today even though then it was the richest country in the world consequences were really severe in terms of the richest country in the world you still had people starving in America but it's a very different time today and I think what we should be more worried about is not so much turning into the 1930s, but actually what is a recovery going to look like? Is a recovery just going to be um, back to mediocre growth? Or can we you know, aspire to something more? Can we use this as an opportunity almost to say we need to take control again of our economic policy and where we think we should be heading? It might be distasteful in a way, the way that I'm beginning to think, but having been to China and India and seen the, the peasant classes and things and I met a girl whose father had to cut a thousand heads of hair every year for her to go to university and I was the the second or third foreigner that she'd ever met. I find myself rooting for these countries. I've, I've read phrases like western sluggishness and eastern dynamism but that's sort of an abstract way. To me it's eastern sweat and western wealth and I wonder what I don't want I don't want the world to be poor, but if, if us being less rich means that China and India has more wealth, I welcome that. Well, I wonder if it really is a question of direct competition. Um, if one part of the world has to fail for another part to be able to succeed. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, then surely there's something wrong with the system that requires that in order, to, in order for growth in general. It seems very much that these economies, through... Uh, financial aid are now subsidising Western economies' debt, or they're at least helping to finance Western economies, while at the same time they're exporting uh, manufactured goods to the Western the, to the Western economies. And so, in, in essence, we're buying back from them using the money that they have given to us. Is that really a a very effective or productive means of generating wealth in the long term for both? side of the world as it were you know uh, should we have to sort of uh, you know cut down on our expenses etc for other places to flourish I mean I, I yeah and I think I disagree on that point in the sense that you know at the beginning of the industrial revolution everyone in Britain didn't have a bath in their house um, but now we can't imagine living without it and there's no way um, you know, we're going to say let's cut back for some people because everyone can't have a bath in this country. You know? But there'd be millions of people in China without a bath. Yeah, but that's what I mean. There was a point when we could have thought the same thing. It, when the Industrial Revolution started, it was, you know, everyone didn't have one. It's a political issue um, as much as or more than it might be an economic issue. It's about, you know, what we aspire in terms of our society to have. And I think if in China people want to aspire to something, it doesn't necessarily mean we have to cut down because we could have thought that at the beginning of the industrial revolution and then maybe today everyone that's just one example but we wouldn't have had so many of the things that we have today because we we aspired to them as well you know yeah i think i think that's correct and we went through that period of blood sweat and tears to rise rise up and then to be able to diversify into soft services like finance and credit i mean what what is that really and then you know you have people who are doing the grunt work of the world and in some ways, I think, which is shocking in a way, but may, may the best man win. If they are working and they are going to rise to at least an equal level with us, to possibly overtake us, then we need to look at ourselves. And I think it's completely natural. I, I don't want to work, you know, building something with my hands. I don't want to do that. And it's not expected that I will do that. But the expectations for them are completely different we need to fairly give them some concessions. And if there's only a finite amount of money in the world in some sense, in terms of some countries will import and some countries will export, then we have to, we have to take the consequences. I'm not sure for how much longer that simplified relationship will, will um, last, though, because if we're talking about the UK 
um, increasing our manufacturing, surely that will kind of cause a shift in the relationship. As countries like China and India are becoming more wealthy, then they, they'll they too sort of start to change the kinds of sectors that they have growth in. I think it's a nonsense that we'd go back to manufacturing because we can't compete with China. Any country that could import from anywhere will import from China or the because lowest bidder. Cheap. Yeah, we, we just can't compete on labour and, and quality and products. And technology as well. We haven't been developing the same talent technologies yeah. over the past 20 years or say maybe in Japan or I suppose you could say that in, in America they have the whole uh, I, you know, technology, IT, computing in California but other than that, in Western society in general, and in the, in the UK, one could say we haven't been developing what we need to be able to really boost our manufacturing business. About uh, import-export, I would like to have your opinion about protectionism and the Buy American Act, for instance. China effectively lending lots of money to America for America to then buy things off China, which is um, seems like a very strange relationship. China's economy has grown massively. You know, it's now uh, one of the biggest exporters in the world, the biggest producer of so many different goods. But at the same time, America's economy has been growing as well. So the more that China makes, the richer America became. It isn't the situation where um, as the Chinese make stuff, then American manufacturing closes down. That relationship isn't, it doesn't quite work like that. When you mention that you know, sweat and blood in China and Actually, the dynamic cities in China are much better places to live than the countryside where people um, are flocked from. One of the things that the relationship between America and China has shown is that China is just not growing fast enough. So China, instead of spending much more of this money, the trillions of dollars that they've invested in American debt, instead of spending that on infrastructure, you know, healthcare or different uh, type ways of developing their economy, they've been playing safe and putting that in American bank accounts. So you can see with that, we are talking about protectionism and the relationships between global governments has real practical consequences on the ground for how developing economies develop. So instead of you know, people taking capital and allocating it where it's needed, actually it's needed most in the developing world, but it's been shifted from the developing world to the developed world. So there's been a real problem with the way global finance has operated in the fact that the people who have less capital and need it most have been transferring their money to the countries that have most capital and need it less. And that's one of the things where I think you can have a you know, real political intervention in what's taking place with how the global economy works. Actually demanding that we stop sucking in all this money from the people that need it. Is that the same, you know, reallocating capital uh, to places uh, where it's most needed in order for them to grow, etc., etc.? Is that the same as what Jess was saying earlier about um, we in, you know, richer or Western nations or whatever um, need to cut down um, in order to let other people have a go and all that kind of stuff. So we need to, you know, our standards of living and all of that has to go down in order for people in other parts of the world and their standards of living to go up. It, it, is that how it works? Because I don't want to reduce my living standards, <laughs> to be quite honest. I'd like to increase them, in fact. It can sound like that, saying that capital needs to be invested in the developing world rather than in the West. But actually, it doesn't follow quite simply that investing more in the developing world means that we can seem less in the West. We can all still grow. There's just a very important uh, problem with the way that um, global finance is operating at the moment, which is to do with the lack of uh, authority on the world stage that countries, poorer countries have. Um, it doesn't follow from saying that the world should be a more just place in terms of how countries operate that we in the West should hold back. We should actually um, probably see our role in the West as you know, developing the kind of uh, technologies and infrastructure and relationships with the developing world which enable everyone to benefit. So I think we can all grow, but that doesn't mean that you can't identify real problems with the way that money is still going from where it's needed most to where people have most. Yeah. Is that not also an element that when people in the developing world uh, have more, their economies grow, it kind of means more for everybody because uh, more resources are coming to play, more wealth being produced to be shared out, into the glo pushed into the global economy and sort of shared around? Is, would you hurt that? Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing, you're talking about a relative thing, so you're, talk you're not talking about a pie that's being shared out, you're talking about the fact that with the growth of uh, large economies like China, 
more wealth is being created every year. Vast amounts of new wealth are being created. That wealth could either generate um, asset levels in the West, either share prices you know, go up too high or house prices just rocket. All that money could be used uh, productively. It could be used um, to actually expand our economies even more rather than creating problems for the world economy. I think that's one of the things we have to realise is that the credit crunch is not really the result of um, failure um, of growth in, in one sense. It's the result of the success of the global economy over the past 10, 15 years. The vast amounts of new wealth that have been generated around the world. Um, we've just not been able to utilise that money properly. It's been... You know, it's gone through city institutions who have you know, been celebrating how great they were at managing risk and managing all this money over the past 10 years. Um, and they've failed massively in their job to allocate capital where it can be used most productively. So we should be you know, pointing fingers at that failure. But it's not just a technical failure. There is a real political failure about mm -hmm. the relationship between the rich world and the developing world. Are there any particular... Um, specific examples of um, of misallocations of funds? Well, surely it's a complete misallocation of funds whenever you spend additional money on extracting more finite natural resources instead of developing things like renewable energy. Right. I would call that a gross misallocation of funds. Uh, I guess another example would be the, the housing bubble, which you just mentioned, which I kind of refer from what you said is a result of um, this money that we don't know what to do with. We've got, we're so, we've got so much money, we don't know how to invest it properly. So it's almost ending up in people's uh, personal bank accounts and uh, serving that, well, things that should be kind of staples of life, like accommodation, are becoming more and more expensive because, partly because no more housing being built in this country and partly because uh, there's enough money to kind of push the prices up. But that money's sort of being kept in the upper echelon society or the people who've actually made the wealth, like the city fat cats, for instance. Um, so, I mean, would one example would be a possible sort of stimulus package, could one focus be to build more houses? I mean, to kind of invest in infrastructure on that level, would, would you say? I mean, that seems to be another example. Yeah, I think that's probably a very important way of understanding. I think it's quite different from what Mike was saying about um, a discussion you could have about whether you invest in new technologies or uh, you know, coal, that kind of thing. That's a, a kind of particular discussion about your take on uh, the environment. But I think... Um, the discussion about housing is much more important because the UK has had the worst of all possible worlds. I mean, there's been housing housing boom in Spain and America and pretty much all the countries that have attracted this capital from China and the oil exporting economies. Um, they've had a massive ex explosion in the price of housing. The one thing that the UK has lacked, which every other country has had, is an explosion in house building. So America has got much more houses than it had at the start of this process. All we've had is houses becoming more expensive for everybody. So I think it's a very sensible idea to say, yes, you know, we should be building much more houses. You know, if we are going to take this money in the first place, we should do something useful with it rather than, as you say, inflation of house prices with no new housing is just a transfer of wealth from uh, people who don't have houses yet to people who own them already. So it's just a transfer of wealth from the young to the old, really. And I think as well, in, to go back to Mike's point about uh, investment in uh, renewable energy, to me, that, that you're, you're kind of the acceptable face in environmentalism, if you like, because there's a lot of people who would say that what we should do is just bite the bullet, take the recession, cut back on our spending, whereas I think the answer is to environmental problems to invest in alternative technologies to develop around them, if that makes sense. Um, so, I mean, there's been a lot of talk of uh, in the media, certainly that I've encountered, of uh, people saying that uh, the recession is in some ways a good thing because it means we'll have to consume less and uh, it'll be better for the environment, better for the world. Um, I don't know what everyone else thinks about that, but that's really been getting my go recently. You could say it's not just about consuming less or consuming more, but it's about producing less or producing more as well. I mean, to me, the way talking in terms of you know what we consume is just indicative of our greed. <laughs> that That is still the terms with which we talk about the economy. And it's, you know, we also have to ask, what are we putting into the economy individually and, and collectively? Well, I think that's a really important point. I think you're wrong in the way you've described it, though. I think the fact that the, the economy is discussed in terms of what we consume is less to do with greed and, um, you know, the consumer culture. But it's more to do with the fact that the economy is discussed in that very passive relationship we have with it. So if we talk about what we produce, now that's something you can have a national policy about. 
that's something you can say, well, maybe we should produce more houses, or maybe we should actually produce more uh, wind farms, uh, whichever way you go. When you talk about in terms of consumption, it's very uh, disempowering. You're saying our only relationship with the way the economy works is what we buy at Tesco's or not. So it appears to be you know, very selfish and very focused with um, consumer greed. But actually, it's about low aspirations and saying we can't really have a, uh, an engagement with our society at the level of you know, ideas and practical policy. Our only engagement is through what we do going to Oxford Circus on a Saturday. I guess we're going back to public disengagement there. And um, it seems to me that that... Uh, kind of consumer action, kind of people saying we should buy from certain sources, uh, we should cut back on what we buy. That's the way to um, resolve some of the world's problems. Mm-hmm. Is, uh, in a sense, a result of the fact that people feel so cut off from uh, management of the economy on a more, a, f- a kind of a higher level, like f- from the government. Um, people think they have to make kind of personal lifestyle choices and that's their only way of influencing uh, the way the world works, you know, the way the economy is run, um, which is sad, I think. But also, kind of, you can trace it back, I think, to the fact that the left has sort of collapsed in the wake of the 1980s, when sort of free market ideology just took over, and that's where, well, that's as a result of that, that the economy has been put into uh, sort of, like you say, a more managerial mode of uh, of, of organising things, uh, kind of just a technical discussion on how to manage the market rather than saying, are there sort of alternatives to this, this way of running things? Um, I mean, that's the kind of political discussion that nobody seems to have anymore. The collapse in the 80s was important in as much as it removed this dichotomy of ideologies, which allowed us to challenge the dominant ideology, but it didn't change the fact that there was still an elite that determined what happened in the economy. If we're talking about under communism, it's the government. If you're talking about under capitalism, it's perceived by the wider public, especially here in the UK, that this elite are, you know, the financiers, the people in the city. These are the people who control the economy. And I think that this kind of idea that somebody else controls it is is a negative thing in itself. And it is um, a negative way to perceive politics because, I mean, it's not just down to this major dichotomy of two systems. It's down to your individual input on how these things are run. And I mean, a big part of our lives is our jobs. We can choose what jobs we do. Entrepreneurs change the way businesses are run. They create new niches, they innovate, and they change things. I mean, renewable energy comes from invention. I mean, there's there's so much that people don't think of as activity that really is. And when people disengage, it's when you just do a job because it's a job. But people's engagement with uh, the economy and an ideological political engagement with the economy has never really been through what they do for a living. It's actually... Uh, historically been much more people when people are able to step back from their own particular circumstances their own particular job and say not as an employee but as a citizen I've got some stake in how uh, the country should be run but why are those two things separate you're an employee and a citizen you don't separate it out I mean if you go back through history you can find loads of examples where people were politicized because of their jobs you know in the 70s you've got the miners you know and you go hundreds of years back you've got the Luddites the two things are connected Oh yes, schools are connected, but there's a difference between having a narrow focus on your role as an employee and you don't like what your employee is doing, and having a political understanding about your role as an active uh, citizen in a society, that you might have something in common with someone's got a different job than you. Oh, okay, I agree. So, okay, I agree that, that, that it, should, it isn't down to a narrow interest group, but I think that not seeing that your role as something other than just a citizen can change things is the negative uh, aspect. If that, if you follow, I mean, you know, it's not that you're a minor, that you have certain beliefs. It's that because you're a minor, you can challenge this aspect of the system that is wrong. Yeah, well, that's certainly more important in the sense of it's a very different thing from the discussion um, that was raised a minute ago about people's role just being one of consumers. And I thought you put it really well when you said... But actually what it means is that the government then shifts its policy from managing the economy to managing people. Because the job is a public thing. So that's a very different thing from um, your role as a consumer. I think I'd agree with you on that. Mm. If we'd had a different government, would the outcome of this been different? And also, as the public, we borrowed so much money. If there was less income tax, would that have altered um, the outcomes we have now? There's just been such a consensus over the past 10 years about the economy in the UK. When Gordon Brown made the Bank of England independent, then that was something that was supported across the political spectrum. 
Gordon Brown saying that the economy should be managed by people who aren't engaged in a political discussion. That was something that everybody supported. I think everybody for the past decade has been celebrating the financial service sector in the UK, saying that they're just doing a great job. So if the Tories were in power for the past 10 years, then the chances are they would have done exactly the same as what Gordon Brown has been doing. One of the important things to recognise is that the fallout of the credit crunch has caught everybody by surprise. Everybody thought the world has changed, boom and bust has gone, great moderation, growth is here, globalisation is great. So, you know, that's, I think that's the real political challenge at the moment, is to say, how do we really understand what's taken place? So now um, more people are becoming redundant and more people are leaving school and they're going out trying to get jobs, but and there's no money left for people. So if we're trying to go on benefits and we're trying to get help, we're trying to get housing, there's no way for us to do it because there's no money. So what are now people supposed to do now we're out in the world with no help? Well, this is one area where I think the government has been a bit clear in its guidance. It's, it's almost tried to devolve responsibility and tried to say people, we need to encourage entrepreneurs, we need to encourage people to act for themselves. And so... The answer, perhaps, is try and find yourself a place in society, try and make yourself a job, try and try and be active and, and engage, you know. I mean, everyone can find a pen and paper and, you know, everyone can write and everyone can talk and everyone can form groups to engage on these ideas. And, and I think that that would be a positive move. I think that's a positive move in theory and definitely engagement is always a positive thing. But then at the same time, if they're even if they're making these ideas and they're developing ideas for businesses if there's nowhere or no money to invest in these projects then how are they going to work yeah i think that's an important thing if you're going to set up a business you need capital that's the bottom line even if uh, all the money that's been pumped into the economy is going to have a stimulating effect over the next few years then the reality is we've come out of 10 years or more of massive growth in government spending the number of jobs that have been created over the past 10 years two out of three have come from the public sector and with the new debt that the UK government's taking on, not just issuing uh, new debt, but taking on the balance sheets of the major financial institutions, then there's going to be a real call for that to be reduced by a significant amount in the next few years. So at the very time when people need that kind of support, it's going to be dragged away from them. You know, we live in a rich economy. You know, it's going to be a severe problem for a country like China when you've got 25, 30 million people unemployed losing their jobs and no social safety net. We do have that in this country. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to stand up and say that needs to be defended now more than ever. So although, you know, there will be job shortages, there's also the, is it the, the class of Britain that are not working. And that's something, you know, that's, that's sort of a philosophical kind of shift. I mean, there's, there is talk about um, you know, welfare Britain and you know, people living on incapacity benefits for a long time. That's been the case for the past 10 years, that situation. Um, it hasn't changed because of the credit crunch. I'm not sure it has anything to do with the recession or really is any way out of the recession. There's a difference between initial reactions to stem the bleeding, that is, and to stop uh, people's lives being destroyed in the immediate here and now. And I think that's a very important thing to do when government spending will be cut back. The government will be pushing ideas about austerity. And those ideas will be supported by a lot of people who think actually we should reduce our uh, spending anyway and reduce our um, lifestyles. So I think that's a political thing to challenge where I think we might want to focus our attention, which is a wider political understanding about how we re-engage with organising society. You know, putting the idea that the economy is something that can be managed and publicly debated back onto the agenda, because it has been managed over the past 10, 20 years. It just hasn't been managed publicly. It's been managed by you know, the technocrats who are not accountable to um, the people's lives they're impacting upon. There's talk about you know the emerging economies, the BRIC countries, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, like and and of those, India and China being the big players, and China being very good at hard services, and India being very different, very good at soft services. Do you have a prediction of which of those two might emerge as the next America? China already is a major force in the global economy. In terms of what's going to happen over the next 50 years or the next two generations maybe, then obviously, hopefully, we'll see China become a much larger part of the economy. I think the challenge at the moment is to work out how that happens, um, how we encourage that to happen at a time when people are saying, you know, we've got 
problems with uh, you know, the, the planet, biodiversity, China building coal power stations. We should really encourage that rather than and work out how we deal with the rise of much of the developing world and their incorporation into the kind of prosperity we have in the West and see that as a positive thing rather than a negative thing. In terms of what technically is going to happen, I'm, I can't predict. But. It does terrify me, though, the thought that a country such as China that's not democratic could be the most powerful country in the world. That really frightens me. And I think, you know, in some ways, like, India's culture is is being exported along with its goods. And you can see that, you know, with the rise of Bollywood and, you know, that, um, you know, the national dish, dish is tikka masala and things. And it's a much more sort of, it's, it's a nicer country to have in charge. You know, if, if that's the way we also think of our politicians, we want a nice politician in charge. And, and I must say that, you know, with China's sort of um, ideologies, it concerns me that the speed at which they might you know, gain more and more of a footing in, in world politics as well as the economy. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily a question of uh, it being a good country running the world that we should have, that we should have to put up with or a bad country. I mean, I, personally, I think America's done a great job of running the world, you know, being the, the global superpower. Um, and who's to say that uh, China won't have achieved democracy by the time it does achieve some kind of uh, supposedly global hegemony? Um, because people are becoming more wealthy and have more say in how their countries run because of that simple fact. I mean, if you think about the democratic process in Britain, um, 200 years ago, we were just entering the Industrial Revolution, we were not a modern standard democracy. There was a lot wrong with the way the country was run. And here we are. I mean, there's still some way to go, obviously, but, you know, a long way has been come. Uh, so I don't necessarily think it's a question that it's a good country or a bad country is going to run the world, but... I think it's romanticising India just a little bit to say, yeah, that's <laughs> you know, it's not like India isn't without its problems and stuff. And it's also this idea that the moment China rises to power, we might all become uh, communists or something, you know. And I, you know, it's it's China's business how they're going, how their politics and everything is going to evolve and emerge and all that kind of stuff. Um, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't grow. You suddenly got us talking about what we can encourage and what we can discourage. And then this has all sprung from a debate about how disengaged individuals are from this whole system. We've suddenly pulled right back out and started talking about this macro political level. And, and you know, I really want to know how anyone thinks we can really influence this. I think, yeah, it is, it is kind of a odd thing that, you know, if, if a country is poor, it's okay for it to be communist, but... Um, we, we wouldn't want them uh, to be rich as well as uh, being run by communists. So for so long now, six nations have governed the global economy to a huge extent. That dominance has partly caused the problems we're in at the moment. So the reason that um, China's been really is being held back in terms of its development because it's exporting 10% of its capital to the states every year. And that's a significant amount of money that the Chinese could use domestically to improve the life for the people who live there. What we should be thinking about is demanding from our political leaders that we stop demonising China and threatening China. And the whole discussion about protectionism, which will become more and more important over the next few years, I'd have, I would have thought, as you know, we desperately try and deal with our economic problems, there's a, a chance that our political leaders will be able to say, well, the fault lies elsewhere. And we shouldn't accept that. So those kind of tensions between nations, I think, will become more important. And you know, as our role um, as citizens in this country, I think the strongest and most progressive thing we could probably do is put our own governments under a bit of pressure and say, you know, why are you talking about China? You know, China's not the problem here. It is how the economy has been managed or well, mismanaged, really, for the past decade or more. On that note, that's all we've got time for, but thank you to Stuart Simpson for coming in and giving us your time. You've been watching Don't Shout at the Telly, change a message on it. If you'd like to leave a comment, then please do so, and if you'd like to get involved in further issues, then please get in touch.